Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 225 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I am a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book is called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. So go and check that out on Amazon today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring fraternity and sorority leaders together and college students together. Fun fact, today we are going to have an opportunity to talk about one of my favorite all-time superhero movies, and of course, it's Black Panther. When it first came out, it was not lost on me that this is the first time we're seeing a groundbreaking film where the superhero lead is a Black man and the cast is full of strong, positive male and female Black characters of various ages. So you've got positive Black role models, you've got racial identity, capitalism, history, you've got the effects of nationalism. All of this comes into play once you take a deeper dive on what we're seeing up on the screen, which is what makes this film one of the best, in my opinion. So I am so excited that our next guest is going to be able to break all of that down for our listeners today. Our next guest is Dr. Sheena Howard. Sheena is an award-winning author, filmmaker, and scholar. In 2014, Sheena became the first Black woman to win an Eisner Award for her first book, and it's called Black Comics, Politics of Race and Representation and that was done in 2013. The Eisner Awards are considered the Oscars of comics. She is also the author of several critically acclaimed books and comic books. In 2017, Sheena published the Encyclopedia of Black Comics, which is the first book of its kind, profiling over 100 Black people in the comics industry. The Encyclopedia of Black Comics was named the 2018 American Library Association's Outstanding Reference Source. Sheena was born and raised in Southwest Philly. She now has one child. She's a professor at Ryder University in the Department of Communication and Journalism. Outside of her full-time job, Sheena spends time writing and speaking to organizations and educational institutions on a variety of topics, including social justice, diversity, and representation. Welcome to the show, Dr. Howard. Thank you. I am happy to be here and happy to talk. I know, this is so great. I mean, I was just looking over everything that you've done and I'm just blown away because I'm like, our listeners have got to hear from Gina. I mean, this is just absolutely incredible stuff. So I, let's talk about the beginning. You decided on Iona College for your undergraduate experience. You played basketball for them as well. So what made Iona the right place for you? So, you know, when I was in high school, I wanted to live in New York. Like we had visited and like something about even the graffiti looked different. I was like, oh, like everything was just bigger and better in New York to me as a high school kid. And so when it came time to go to college, my list was actually based on the basketball scholarship that I was going to get. So I had a few different offers. And when it came down to it, Iona College seemed like the perfect place because it was a D1 school to play basketball at. It wasn't too big like some of the other schools that I had visited. And it was just far enough from home where your parents couldn't just pop up, but close enough where I could get to them if I needed them. Um, and so it was just the perfect place for me. I love that story. Totally get the scholarship with basketball. I think that's fantastic. I'm a huge women basketball, uh, you know, fan in terms of college. Last night I was watching Tennessee, unfortunately, in a barn burner beat Belmont, which was here local. And Tennessee before that, in the round before that, they took out my alma mater, the University of Buffalo. So, nice. uh, so Tennessee took out two of my teams. Nice. <laughs> and it's just killing me. But hey, it is what it is. And uh, it was a great game. So at the end of the day, that's all you can ask for, right? <laughs> great sport. It's a great sport and fun to watch for sure. Totally fun. Now you earned your PhD from Howard University, uh, Doctor of Philosophy, Intercultural and Rhetorical Communication. And you've been featured on various media outlets. You appeared on NPR, ABC, BBC, PBS, as well as other networks and documentaries as an expert on popular culture, politics, and social justice. You help other academics and other independent scholars to raise their profile and also gain major media coverage. So I'm wondering, what are your tips for getting all of this visibility that you get? You know, um, I'm a storyteller, I'm a writer. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of it is just creating the story and telling the story for the journalists, the producers, and the host of these shows and just, 
connecting your story to something that's going on in the culture or something that's going on in society that is timely and relevant and just creatively pitching that story to the people who make decisions to feature you on these media outlets. And so instead of just paying a publicist thousands and thousands of dollars a month to do these things, you really can do it on your own. Um, people are more accessible than ever before, um, particularly on places like Twitter, you know, that's where the hosts and journalists are. So I do a lot of my pitching of myself and my work um, in Twitter. And that's, that's what I teach um, other academics to do people who have masters or PhDs, I teach them how to increase their visibility, authority and income through the same techniques that I've used um, over these last 10 years. Wow, that is so smart. And you're absolutely right. I've had total strangers reach out to me on Twitter and I'll actually answer them. I'll exactly. actually respond to them because I'm like, all right. And it just gives like, you access to just about anybody on Twitter. And, and that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that sometimes it's just a matter of sending an email or sending a tweet to someone and saying, hey, you know, can I be on your show or can I work with you? Like, the reason why I'm writing um, DMC's uh, graphic novel from Run DMC is because I sent him an email and said, hey, like, I see you have this comic book line. Can I write for you? And, um, you know, sometimes it's just about saving those contacts, understanding when is the appropriate time to reach out and then offering them something instead of asking them for something. Right. So if, you, if you're going to pitch a journalist to be on a show, you know, you're, you're going to give them the story, tell them why you should be on that platform instead of just saying, hey, I've done all this amazing stuff and having the journalists try to figure out why they should have you on the platform. You just got to give them the story. It's so smart. I mean, they're so overworked as is. So if you just give them the story, then they're like, exactly. man, this is written already. Like, I don't have to do any exactly. work, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And in 2014, you became the first Black woman to win an Eisner Award for your book, Black Comics, Politics of Race and Representation. And uh, then, of course, you published the Encyclopedia of Black Comics. You're also the co-writer of the comic book Superb, which is about a teenage superhero that has Down syndrome. And yeah. obviously, you've drawn lots of inspiration from comic books. So what yeah. is it about comic books that makes you put all of this effort into this particular form of media? So it's kind of like a bi-directional relationship because when I try to get away from it, it just pulls me back in. But also when I went to Howard University to do my PhD, I actually wrote an entire dissertation on the Boondocks comic strip, um, which was a comic strip and then it turned into an animated television show and it was about um, these two black boys living in the suburbs. Um, one had radical views and then one was just like a victim of um, hip hop materialism. And so that was my entryway into comics and I wrote a dissertation on it. So naturally, you know, the comics world is gonna follow me for the rest of my life because I wrote this dissertation. And then I went on to write a book based on my dissertation. Um, I edited and wrote a chapter in the book called Black Comics, Politics of Race and Representation, which just so happened to make me the first black woman to win an Eisner Award. So, you know, all of these things just came together um, and, and so now I'm, I'm in the thick of being a comic book writer, a graphic novel writer, and it's just a great medium because you can, you can reach children, you can talk about history in a graphic novel that kids will actually like to read without giving them an actual novel that they might not read. When you put the pictures with it and then there's a little bit of text, you can actually tell a fun and, and engaging story for young people and for adults that doesn't feel overwhelming and can be kind of cool and fun when you match it up with the graphics. So I think it's a great medium that actually has so much untapped potential. Like it's, it's to me, the comics industry is, is still a baby in terms of um, the potential that it has. Wow, that is so cool. I, I love everything about that. Um, and, you know, it doesn't stop there because in 2016, you directed, produced, and wrote the documentary called Remixing Colorblind, which explores the ways that the educational system shapes our perception of race. And you've twice received a proclamation from the city of Philly for your literary work, social justice, and creative projects. So talk to our audience a little bit about what your findings were from this documentary. Yeah, for the documentary Remixing Colorblind, you know, the, the, the research is out there in terms of, you know, the relationship between race and educational outcomes and that kind of thing. And so what I was doing with that film was to say, well, 
how do we package in a way that the everyday person would find engaging and want to pay attention to? Because we know that we know the stats, we know that, you know, um, educational opportunities and access are linked to zip codes. We, we are all of that stuff is out there in research studies. Um, so the, the film was 30 minutes and it was just about packaging all of that information into something that um, the masses could appreciate, enjoy and watch in, in, in a relatively short period of time. But the cool thing about it was that film just features you know young people talking about their experiences um from a very honest perspective both black and white about how they understand race in the education system right and so we have some very interesting and nuanced perspectives from those kids um in that film and it's available for free on youtube as well that's very cool the other thing i love about you is you're a professor at Ryder university in the department of communication and journalism so what is it about college students that actually makes you want to stay in that role and you've been doing it for over 10 years yeah you know i think um not enough people actually like their jobs unfortunately right and i actually like my job it's um you know i'm a teacher at the core like ever since i was little I wanted to be a teacher and everything that I learn, I like to teach. If I learn something, I want to teach the world about it. If I do something amazing, I want to teach the world how they can do that too. And so college, um, being a college professor, it just wraps up all of my love for the things that are at the core of me kind of into one nice bow. And then I have some flexibility that you wouldn't have at say a nine to five corporate level job where the summers I can spend doing my writing and those types of things and do cool projects around my area of expertise. So it kind of gives me most of what I want in a job and still allow me allows me the freedom to kind of um, create. I like to create. Yeah, you and I are very alike, I think, in that uh, regard. I also do some work for a local university, um, but I also want that freedom where I can go out and share this information with college students all over the country. So I like living in both worlds for me. I think it's it's exactly. important. I want to showcase my creativity. I mean, I actually went to school for accounting of all things. I, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, these debits and credits are just so boring. <laughs> And it's like, I, I have this creativity to me that wasn't being utilized. And I knew, like, I could sense that my creativity was just like slowly dwindling. And I'm exactly. like, if I don't make a move now, that creativity is going to be gone forever. Exactly. exactly. And I'm, a, I'm an advocate, obviously, for education. I have a PhD, but there are some elements of the educational system that kind of steal your creativity. It kind of limits your creativity. I mean, every assignment in school has parameters. You can't do it this way. You have to do it this way. And in some ways that can limit your, you know, your creativity. And so I, I think when you leave college, you have to figure out how to get that creativity back and find out what it is inside that you really want to do. What is your purpose, which might not be at all connected to the thing that you got a degree in. And that's okay. Yeah, that 100% that happened to me it happens that's the thing and it's okay like just like right. you said, it is it's okay so and I think that the cool thing is I think a lot of us find that we might do something that's not connected to our de degree but that degree does benefit us in whatever it is we decide to do I have three different degrees of business degree, a degree in graphic design and a degree in intercultural communication and all of the things that I'm doing now use all three of the core elements of those degrees you're so right i mean my degree in, in accounting i never want to do accounting but i'll tell you what if you're going to be an entrepreneur if you understand an income statement and exactly. balance sheet and you know how to do your own taxes and you don't need exactly. to pay somebody else to do it exactly i mean just understanding how to run a business and exactly. you know what is a successful business versus a non-successful business yep. I don't have to go to anybody to tell me how my yep. business is performing because I know because that's what my degree is in. And even if you decided to hire an accountant, you would know what to look for. You would know the questions to ask. So even that's not the core of what you're making money at doing right now, it's still benefiting you. 100%. You know, the other thing that, you know, we got to be talking about Black Panther because in 2018, the Marvel Cinematic Universe finally delivered on something that all the fans have been waiting for forever, which was a feature film with a solo Black superhero. And you edited this book. It's called Why Wakanda Matters. So what can we learn from Black Panther's portrayal of culture virtually untouched by white supremacy? Yeah. 
there's so much to learn from that movie. And I actually did a mini podcast on the book so that the contributors can come and talk about the different chapters that they wrote in that book. Um, there's conversations to be had around fear, the fear that is depicted in that film, the fear that both T'Challa had and Killmonger, right? They both were operating from places of fear. Just It just looked very different. Um, you know, we talk about racial identity development and how you can learn about racial identity development through those two main characters, Killmonger and T'Challa. Um, but in terms of like what a society would look like untapped by, uh, by like racism, you know, they still hid in plain sight, like Wakandans still hid in plain sight. They were still operating in some ways from a place of fear. But the chapter that I wrote in the book, I talk about cognitive dissonance, dissonance right? Mental discomfort that T'Challa had because he was very nationalistic, uh, an isolationist, right? And it took something traumatic in order for him to say, hey, you know, we can't be this isolated place. We actually have to go in the into the world and share our resources and interact with the world. And so it is just a really interesting film to dissect. And once you once you read the book, Why Wakanda Matters, and then go back and watch the movie, man, you you have such a different perspective and such a, a kind of a, a deeper kind of um, thought process around what you're actually seeing in that film. Yeah, I can't wait to watch the movie again because it's yeah. like now you're starting to really comprehend what they were trying to tell us. And then when you juxtapose that over what's actually happening in the world today, right. then it's like, wow, like this is yeah. deep. This is yeah. important conversation. Right, things might be happening out there, but as you saw in Wakanda, the war is going to come to you, right? You can't operate in in an isolationist fashion forever, right? Because we're all connected from one side of the world to the other side of the world. Problems are going to come to you, even if you try to stay in your own bubble. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that a little bit more. I mean, right now, it does seem like so many countries in the world, they're all shifting to one of nationalism. I mean, you really can't call it anything else. But in Black Panther, now all of a sudden, there are some really important messages in, term, in terms of T'Challa's nuanced identity. And eventually, he does make that shift. You yes. see that learning process where we got to go from nationalism uh, to globalism. So, right. I mean, so what should the people of the world really take from that? I mean, from that lesson? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. But I, I think we all have to, we're all in the boat together, right? We're all in the boat together. We all have to live here together. And the more we try to either separate ourselves or, you know, have an imperialistic perspective where we're just going to take over other places, neither one of those options in the long run are going to work. And so we have to find a way to live peacefully together, respecting everyone's views and seeing what we can learn from other places. You know, America has its own issues around, say, you know, gender, right, around, around um, fairness and gender. And we look at some other countries and we criticize them about the way they treat women but there's actually some things that those countries that we criticize do that actually we could incorporate into our own system to make our own gender issues better right maternity leave right those types of things so i think we can learn from each other if we just have a more open perspective in terms of what can we learn from each other and how can we not come from a um you know an imperialistic perspective that we are better than others Man, that has implications to all of mankind. I mean, you can take it to what's going on between Russia and Ukraine right now. You can even take it to your local fraternity or sorority that refuses to talk to people from other councils uh, and yeah. learn from them. Because I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other if we just okay. sat down and had a conversation. Because I think some councils do some things really well and then other councils do other things really well. So exactly. we, we can help each other. We're all in this thing together. And so, right. man, I mean, the lessons just go on forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I also watched your TEDx talk, which I thought was absolutely amazing. And you talked about being in an abusive relationship, but you mentioned very clearly that this is not the end of your story. You wanted to take accountability for all the decisions that led you to that point where you're ending up in this abusive relationship. And you were really letting other people define your story up until that point. Right. So how did you finally take control? How did you finally set out on your journey of self-empowerment and get the freedom that you were seeking? 
Yeah. Sometimes, you know, you talk to people and the worst thing that's ever happened to them in their life turns out to kind of be the best thing. Turns out to be, you know, they learn a lesson from that crisis that was life changing that propelled them to the next level to a better place. And I would say me being in an abusive relationship, it was traumatic. It was hard even leaving it. You know, they the most dangerous time for someone in, a, in an abusive relationship is actually when they leave. And that was true for me as well. And, you know, after I left, there were still years of um, abuse, quite frankly. And so, you know, for me, the process of just going back and understanding how, you know, someone with a PhD, I'm very smart, you know, confident. Um, how did I end up in that abusive relationship? relationship and really just going back to ch ch childhood and understanding um, things that I didn't think affect affected me did affect me. And so just really taking 100% full responsibility for, for where I ended up so that I can then take 100% full responsibility for where I am going. And this is a, a nuanced, tough conversation to have because obviously you don't want to blame people who are in abusive relationships because it's not their fault, right? The abuser is the one um, that is committing the crime. Um, but also, you know, at the for me at the beginning of that relationship, you know, it, I should have left. So there, there was some, some, some digging inside of me that I had to do to understand why I didn't and to understand why I didn't have the self-worth or self-esteem that I actually thought I had. So pay, um, peeling back those layers so that I can go on to, to be the highest version of myself and not find myself in a relationship, both romantically and in a friendship like that again. And so that is what the TED Talk is meant to be inspirational, you know, define your own story, understand that this is not, you know, the end of your story and that you can be the hero of your story because the only difference between a hero and a villain is how they deal with adversity. That's the only difference. And so the only difference between you being the hero of your story or you being the villain of your story is how you dealt, how you're dealing with adversity. Wow. Well, you're definitely the hero because what you did there was very brave to share that. And I think it just basically shows that anybody could end up in that position where you're maybe ignoring or glancing over all those red flags that you saw when you were first with this person. Um, and then you ended up obviously in a situation that was awful uh, and traumatic and has had an impact on you clearly. Um, but I'm so glad that you shared that because I know how many people around the world, uh, you know, should listen to it and, and what they would take from it if they actually listened to that TED talk, because it men, is men, women, men, women, straight, yeah. gay relationships. You know, some studies are showing that, um, LGBTQ relationships have even higher rates of domestic abuse. That's something that's not talked about. I actually, um, wrote a fiction book, um, about this topic. And so, you know, I, I think that's just really important. You know, men can be in an abusive relationship as well. And sometimes you don't even know that you're in an abusive relationship, especially if there's significant mental abuse going on. You sometimes you're you're so deep in it that you don't even know that you're in an abusive relationship. Yeah, I'm so glad that you said that. And you're right. I think it applies. Your story applies to anybody. It really doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, uh, what sex they are, gay, straight. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, that happens everywhere. Uh, rich, poor, I mean, whatever, right? Um, you know, and the other thing was that you also told this story of your mom buying you the best sneakers that were out. And mm -hmm. you asked her if, if basically, are we rich as a family? <laughs> and she just smiled at you and she really didn't answer you. And then later you discovered that she had actually declared bankruptcy. Um, right. but, but you clearly had everything that you needed growing up. You never felt like you didn't have everything that you needed. So what are your takeaways from that story as you look back on it today? Yeah, we always had the lights on. We went on vacation. We went to places like Disney World cruises. My mom was at every sports activity. Um, so you couldn't tell me that like my family didn't have money, but my mom is when I got to college, my mom filed for bankruptcy. Literally, she she got me and my brother to and through college. And then, you know, everything just just collapsed. And so, you know, for me, what I take away from that story is that I just had a really good mom. You know, I just I just had a really good mom and she's like the blueprint for the type of mother that I want to be, because as a kid, you shouldn't have to worry about those things. And, and so many kids across America do have to worry about 
you know, are we going to have food on the table? You know, are we going to have lights? Um, they know what to say. They pick up the phone and it's a bill collector. And so just giving all the credit to my mom as a single mom raising two kids in the city of Philadelphia, one of the poorest cities in the country. Um, you know, I just take away that, you know, my mom, you know, did what she had to do, man. And I'm just grateful. Wow. So much respect. I mean, just an incredible job that she did clearly of raising you. Um, it's just amazing uh, and very inspiring too. Um, man, I've loved everything about this interview. You know, the last thing I got to ask is, I mean, you're in Philly, the food in Philadelphia has got to be the best in the country as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the yes, choices you have, I agree. <laughs> it never ends. It just, it never ends. So what is your favorite restaurant in Philly? I want to go and check it out. <laughs> You know, I've been showing up to some of my favorite restaurants and they are closed down. Like wow. some, some, so many of the greatest places have just didn't make it through the pandemic. But I will say since Philly is known for its cheesesteaks and there's always gonna be a cheesesteak debate, my favorite cheesesteak place is Max's on Broad and Erie. I hope it's still there because I haven't been there um, through the pandemic. Broad and Erie, Max's, that's where they were in the movie Apollo with uh, Michael B. Jordan. I'm going to give uh, the best cheesesteak to Max's. Love Coming it. from Dr. Howard. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. They're going to have a big increase in business because of your recommendation now. Yeah, and, right. uh, and I like that you didn't go the traditional route. I mean, you can go talk about cheesesteaks. Everybody goes to one of two. You decided exactly. to go to Max's. I like that. I like exactly. that. <laughs> exactly. This has been great. So if our listeners, if they want to connect with you or they want to bring you into their campus as a speaker, where should they go? So you can go to www.sheenachoward.com. That's my website. All my contact information is on there. You can also get there by typing in Dr. Sheena Howard. That's Dr. Sheena Howard. And then at Dr. Sheena Howard on all of my socials. So I'm, I'm active on Instagram and Twitter right now. Those are the forms that I'm focusing on. So yeah, everybody can, can hit me up and I will respond. That is me on the other side of those DMs. This is great. This has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed getting to know you a little bit better today. And to all of our listeners, if you like Dr. Howard's talk today, make sure that you like it. Make sure you share it with other students on campus that need to hear her message. Go and check out her TEDx talk because it's absolutely incredible. And Dr. Howard, thank you for everything that you do. You're just a breath of fresh air. And I mean, just, I love all the things that you're involved with. I mean, it's dope, all right? That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> all right well thank you so much to our listeners we hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we hope to see you on another episode of the fraternity foodie podcast thanks so much for tuning in we'll see you next time